both in the past and also now in the present, and especially in social media contexts, words and phrases may cross language boundaries. I'd like to demonstrate this with the assistance of you, respective audience, by asking about this word that you see, is it Malay, is it English, or what? Malay. How do you know this? Spelling. Spelling, absolutely. And of course, incidentally, it's far more sensible than Malay spelling because it reflects the pronunciation, doesn't it? The English spelling, P-O-L-I-C-E, Poliche. We don't say it like that, do we? Um, Malay is far more sensible in that respect. Um, I've got a few more of these examples and the same question. Malay, English, or what? How about this one? English. <laughs> is it English? Is it Malay? Oh. Both. You're absolutely right. Yes. If we pronounce it in the English way, fail. That's what we want none of our students to do here, of course. Uh, then yes, fail, gagal, if you like. But if we pronounce it in the Malay way, it means one of those things in which we save our work in MS Word, doesn't it? File. What about this one? Malay, Malay how do we know? Malay. Spelling again, C -A K for C-H and I for Y at the end. Of course, this is an example of a word which, is, of course, is not originally English. It's borrowed from other languages. Greek, to be precise. Um, this is a more local example. <laughs> you may say it's not a word at all. Okay, but it's real because I've given you the reference where this was found, actually, by a student of mine. And I'm not going to embarrass myself and you by attempting to pronounce it in Brunei Malay. But I think you'd agree with me that it is Malay, but from English, from the English phrase, two words, give up. Would you agree? Yes. yes. Okay. And in that context, taken from the Brunei subreddit discussion forum, it makes sense. And again, actually, it reflects the way that many people would pronounce the words, the phrase here. Okay, just a couple more. Again, they'll be very familiar to you. What is this, Malay or English? <laughs> yes, it's the craft in which you go across to the Kampong Air, isn't it? Of course, it comes from, originally, the English motorboat. Yes, but with localized pronunciation. Okay, and I think I have one more like this. <laughs> you know what one of these is? Yes. Absolutely sure that you do, and you probably pronounce it much as it is spelt here, and I'll try to um, glottalize the final k by saying isbo. <laughs> Icebox, refrigerator. These examples, I think, demonstrate the point I made at the beginning. Words and phrases can cross language boundaries. I'd like now to relate this to questions of sustainability and languages, and in particular, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. These, in fact, have very little specific relationship to language, and this is a pity. It is unfortunate, and it has been noted by researchers. Here's a reference. Why are languages missing from the sustainable development goals? But in fact, if we think about it collectively, sustainability and the SDGs relate to languages in many ways. In particular, and I'm going to claim that this has local relevance here, for the preservation and maintenance of less powerful minority languages. You may be asking how, and that's a good question. We know that the whole of Southeast Asia is highly multilingual, that few, 
if any people in the whole region communicate in only one language. Monolingualism is very rare. The majority, including the population of this country, Nagara Brunei Darussalam, both citizens and residents and migrant workers, like myself, habitually use two or more languages on a daily basis. Do we not? Usually, these two languages will be a variety of Malay and a variety of English, but many other languages are also in the mix. So many people, and I've no doubt this includes many of you here tonight, have more than two languages which they can draw on as part of their repertoire, and they draw on these according to expediency who they are talking to and perhaps what they are talking about. So, a few questions now, which I shall briefly attempt to answer, but you're welcome to disagree with my answers. When you have two languages, are they in conflict? Highly topical to Brunei, I was just talking about it before actually, does more English automatically mean less Malay, for example? My answer to that is no, there is no conflict. Likewise, the second question, do they compete for supremacy and dominance, both in the individual brain, which may or may not be pre-wired for language, whether you believe Noam Chomsky or not, um, or do they coexist peacefully? I would say no to the first two questions and speak in favor of peaceful coexistence. Linguists and sociolinguists have written books. There's one in French called La Guerre des Langues, The War of Languages. There's another one in English called Languages in Conflict. But I have never seen languages fighting each other. Have you? People fight each other, sadly. Nations fight each other, but not languages, I don't think. So, more questions that we need to ask relating back to this issue of sustainability and bringing in the question of the survival or the maintenance of less widely used languages. Can these languages survive without so-called borrowing, which of course is a very stupid term. If you borrow a word from another language, you don't give it back, do you? Unlike if you borrow money from the bank for your new car or your new house, the bank will jolly well expect you to give it back, won't they? But even though the word is used, borrowing, basically it's just taking. Can we, for example, talk about information technology in Sang Jati Dusun in Basa Tutong? My answer is there. Yes, of course it's possible. Why not? It is a matter of the potential of each language to develop and spread. In this context, we need to recall that if you go back 800 years to about 1200, English was a low status peasant language used mainly by rural farmers and servants. Maybe some of you were not aware of that. The top and powerful people in England in those days spoke French, thanks to the Norman conquest of 1066, and Latin. English grew, as I think we've illustrated, by taking words from other languages and then later on, 1500 onwards, let's say, spreading across the world to become the global language that it now is. But I'm not going to do a triumphal talk about the spread of English. That's for another day. So, final questions, which maybe I'll leave unanswered and for you to think about, are the notions of first language, sometimes called mother tongue, second language, maybe the language that we learn when we go to primary school, are these still valid? Should they be challenged? If there are no fixed boundaries between them, then it's a problem for us language researchers. How can languages be classified and described? Have dictionaries and grammars written about them? I'll just leave you on that note. Sukyan terima kasih.